You're listening to the Sacred Mama Podcast. I'm your host, Kara Ray, aka the Sacred Mama. I'm a mindset and relationship coach, helping mothers nurture the relationship between themselves, their spouse, and their children. This is also sometimes inside of a co-parenting relationship. This podcast was designed specifically for mothers, stepmothers, and soon-to-be mothers to come together and truly support one another, to have the real, raw, honest, unfiltered, and soulful conversations about the realities of motherhood. My goal is for mothers to reclaim their self-worth and reclaim their self-identity while navigating motherhood. It's time you treated yourself as a priority because most of all, you matter. I believe that you can have the thriving family life. I believe that you can have the booming business. And I believe that you can have the passionate and abundant relationship. Most of all, I believe you can fully love yourself in the now without sacrifice. Throughout this podcast, you'll gain access to the minds of industry leaders and of course, soul episodes by yours truly. So let's dive in. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Sacred Mama podcast. Today I'm super excited. I have Rachel Kay on the podcast. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction for you and then I have one question that I ask all the moms on the podcast and then we're going to dive right into our conversation today. So Rachel is a mom of two boys and she is um, a toddler parenting coach working one-on-one with families, which is absolutely incredible. So she helps you focus on the developmental and behavioral struggles in the home, which is, let me say this work is powerful. And so Rachel has a master's degree in early childhood and has worked with families for over 15 years. So I am super excited to have this conversation with you today. We're going to be talking about speech and language and behavioral issues that are in the home and how as parents, we can notice these behaviors and also, you know, help our children. And and I was trying to figure out the way I was going to put that, but I feel like I I explained it well enough. (laughs) So, Hello, welcome. So the first question that I always have for the moms on the podcast is, you know, what is your definition of motherhood? And if you have a definition of motherhood. That's a great question, actually. You know, it's really just thinking about somebody all the time and thinking about their well-being and what you want for them, the best that they can do, and being there to support and guide them and help them, you know, to teach them the best way that you can. That's beautiful. It's honestly, this question is great because every single mom has a different definition. And it, and that's what, that's what's beautiful about it. Okay. So what I want, what I would love for you to do is I gave a brief description on, you know, the work that you do. And I would really love for you to take a minute or two just to really explain to us, you know, how you, you got into this line of work and really, you know, what lights you up about this? Like, what are some of the biggest aha moments that parents have with their children? Um, so I'm going to let you kind of take it away there. Thank you so much. So as Kara mentioned, when she introduced me, I did go to school for early childhood. I'm certified for special ed and regular ed. I taught a bit special ed preschool, and I did that for a little bit. And then I started to do early intervention, where I worked in the homes one-on-one with the children and the families. And I loved that. I was really able to help them make progress and make a plan that worked for them. It's completely different than being in the classroom. And then I had parents actually start to tell me that they wish I could help other people that weren't just nearby. And that's when I started to branch out. I first did a website and realized that wasn't where my passion is. I do much better working with the parent and working with the families. So I still have the website for all the resources and information, but I really prefer to work one-on-one with families and help them with what's best for their home and their child and what they want to do. And that's really where my passion is. So this is beautiful work. And, you know, my daughter ended up needing, you know, speech language behavioral therapy. And so this conversation is one that, you know, when I connected with you and we were talking about what discussion we were going to have, you immediately had talked about, you know, I, I would love to talk about this. 
And I had one of those moments where I said, wow, there are so many parents who need support like this and just don't simply know. And I remember questioning, is there issues and so I believe these are you know really important conversations and so um did my internet cut out are we good did I, yeah. did I? <laughs> okay we're good sorry my my computer just went your internet is unstable I'm like what <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys anyways conversation continued so I, I'm really curious to know you know what are some common behavioral issues parents should concern themselves with or you know want to address Language is a big concern, and I have to say I get this question more frequently than anything else. It is something that parents are concerned about, they're unsure, but one thing I really want to say, that language development happens in stages. Nobody, no professional, no doctor can tell you what happens exactly at this age, exactly at this point, and that's why there's ranges, and that's what's important to look at. What's also important to look at is the progress. So if you have a little one that's 12 months and now they're 15 months, what is the progress that they've made? And a lot of times the parents like, oh, there's no progress. And then I work with them and there is. And that's what's important to recognize also. The progress that your little one is making over these stages, over these um, periods of time. When they're not making progress, that leads to some concern. Mm -hmm. And that's when you want to speak to your doctor and other things. I also want parents to know that if you have a gut feeling as mama and you know that your little one may not be where you think they should be and your pediatrician says to wait, there's nothing wrong with trying to get other help or seek out some, somebody else even if your pediatrician says to wait. And I, I've dealt with that, I've spoken with parents because sometimes the pediatricians, they say, wait, let's just wait, let's wait. But if you're really feeling that you haven't seen progress in a certain amount of time, that's a concern. And there's nothing wrong with trying to seek out an evaluation or some other help to try to help your child. I love that you brought that up because that's actually what we ended up doing. Um, you know, we talked to our family physician, we talked to a pediatrician and everybody was saying, well, she's a little bit behind, but just let's wait. Let's just wait. Let's just wait. And I was uncomfortable with waiting. I didn't want to wait. I, that wasn't something that I wanted to do. And so we ended up reaching out to a woman who, who has a company here in town and she worked with our daughter for quite, quite a few months. We went to her specifically one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, before everything kind of happened here in the world. And it was incredible. You know, she thrived in that space. We were struggling really a lot trying to figure out how to help her, what the best ways to help her was. But we ended up finding that when we sat there and watched what was going on and how the two of them were interacting, we were then able to formulate or pick up different puzzles and toys and, you know, books and, and different things to help engage the learning, you know, the learning skills or between even how we could support her because I didn't know how to support her. You know, I was an adult who was walking around saying, well, why isn't my daughter at this stage and not understanding their development stages. And also the biggest thing that I did not know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but someone was telling me, you know, when your child is two, they should be speaking two words. And when your child is three, three words, someone had told me this one time. Um, I don't like to open, but that is not correct. Um, if your Thank child, you. okay, good. yeah, that is, it's not correct. Um, and I, I don't, you know, there are numbers. If somebody's very concerned about that, you can reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about mm -hmm. more numbers. I try not to give parents a specific number, but two is a, is a big concern because mm -hmm. at around 18 months to 22 months, so between a year and a half and two years old, is when you see the most abundance of language. I've spoken with parents at 16 months and they're like, oh, not so much, very little. And then I spoke to them again at 19 months. And it's amazing what progress and what difference you could see in that time. So 
between a year yeah. and a half and two years old is when you will see the most abundance of language. They will start to say new words. They will start to understand more and recognize more. During that time is when you see a lot of development happening, a lot of the language forming and a lot more understanding of what's happening also. You know. So with my daughter, I believe she was over two uh, when we actually put her into speech and language therapy um, because she was not, she was not articulating her words. She was not formulating her words. She would point at things and tell us where things were. She would say one word at a time. Um, and there was a concern there. You know, she was reliant, you know, we have a, a large family. And so we almost got used to just saying what it was for her or going and getting what it was for her. And it brought me back. My parents actually reminded me of when I was a kid with my brother that I would do that with him because I would get frustrated that nobody could understand him, but I could. And so they were all, they were like, no, we have, you have to let her and encourage her to formulate the conversation to, to, you know, bring the words and to also, you know, tell you what it is that she's looking for without you telling it. Cause it's not actually, she's not, not having to try. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful that you said that because I tell parents that all the time. And as moms, we anticipate what our little ones want. So we go yeah. get it. But I want to encourage all of you to pull back a little bit, step back, and allow your little one to tell you, to communicate with you, to ask for it. And I tell parents to like forget, to pretend you forgot something. So let's say it's mealtime and your little one's in the high chair. You give them some food, but you didn't give a cup. You always give a cup of milk and you forgot. Just forget and see what they do. Maybe they're going to bang on the, on the high chair. Maybe they're going to scream. Maybe they're going to point, or maybe they're going to say, mom, whatever it is, whatever their response is, that's them communicating with you. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can build on that. But if you just keep doing, you just keep doing everything, they don't need to ask for it. I would also tell parents to like, forget the other shoe. You're getting dressed. And of course, don't, you know, do this when you're rushing out to daycare or school. Do this when you're just going out to the grocery store or to the park and you have a few extra minutes. So you get your little one dressed, you're by the door, forget to put on the other shoe and just see what happens. Let them communicate with you that they need that, that they want it, that they need it and see what happens. It's a great way to encourage language and you could do this every day, all day long, at different points of the day, you hold back a little bit so that they can then communicate with you and share with you what they want. And now it may start with just screaming. Maybe they're just going to scream because they don't have the words yet. And this is where you can work on giving them the words for the situation. Yeah. So if it's the cup, if it's milk, if it's the shoe, whatever it is, when they scream, you then give them the word that you would like them to use. So you can give them the word to replace the screaming. And that's how you can start to teach them we can use the word to get what we want. Yes. I also found that, you know, where my child's interest has been, so what she is really interested in, she's quick to learn the words. When it's not something that she's interested in, she's like, no, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> and we have to work a little bit harder at that. And so I found yeah. that engaging with things that she does enjoy has, has been beneficial for us in building her, you know, her language development, the, you know, her vocabulary in, in itself. Absolutely. One thing I want to suggest, one of the best things to do for your children is to narrate. Narrate everything. And you may feel silly, you know, but narrate what you're doing. Mommy's going to make dinner. I'm going to get the eggs out of the fridge and I'm going to get milk. I need a fork and a spatula. So you narrate what you're doing, but then you also narrate what your little one is doing. So if your little one gets up, you say, oh, you got up, you want a book? 
oh, let's read a book, bring the book over. Just narrate. If you narrate what you're doing, so you're not changing anything, you're doing your normal daily activities and your little one is doing their activities. But if you narrate, children are exposed to about a thousand words an hour just by you talking, just by you talking. So instead of you being silent and just doing what your activity is and getting dinner ready, talk about it. Yeah. Talk about what you're doing to expose them to that language as much as possible. I find now that we've gotten my daughter to the point where she's asking questions. She'll always say, what you doing? What you doing? What you doing? Or why? <laughs> it's kind of a lot of those questions. And so we explain everything to her now. And then she feels like she's a part of it. She has this one stool, especially when we're in the kitchen. She'll pull it right up and she'll watch. And she'll be like, what you doing? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And I know parents get frustrated with the whys and the question, but the questions are how they're understanding a conversation and a back and forth. And so they can ask you a question, you answer, then they ask another, and it goes back and forth. And that's a conversation. That is them understanding that I can add, ask you this question and mommy's going to answer me. And then I can ask another question. So it's a great way to build on their curiosity and expose them to more language as you're doing that. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, can you describe, you know, how you typically would work with, you know, a child? So I know that it's probably different per child, but what are some, what are some things that you do with them? Well, like you said, when I first see it, like you said about the interest, the interest is huge. So when I first see a child, I have a bag of goodies and I bring in all my stuff and I really just see what they like. And I narrate. I sit and narrate every single thing that they're doing. Oh, you stood up. Oh, you sat down. Oh, you want to go to the bag? You look at the book. Let's look. Did you see Mickey? I narrate everything. And then when I get to know the child a little bit more, I'm able to bring toys that they are interested in. Because they may also be a little bored of the toys that's in their house. So me coming in and bringing new toys is fun and exciting. But if they don't like it, they're not going to touch it. You know, like I have this Elmo doll yeah. and it sings the ABCs and it counts and, you know, it has Velcro. It's a whole Elmo doll. I have had kids that love it yeah. and I could teach the whole ABCs with that Elmo toy. I've had kids that won't even touch it. So I really have to find what they're interested in. I worked with a little boy that loved dinosaurs. And let me tell you, before this, I didn't know anything about dinosaurs, but I learned very quickly. And I made everything about dinosaurs. So I taught him how to count by using dinosaurs. I taught him size by using dinosaurs. This is big, this is little. You know, in other words, this one can fly and this one eats on the floor making it up. But just like Kara said, if you find something that your little one's interested in, I encourage you to use it more than right there in your living room. Use it all the time. You know, use it any way that you can. If you're in the car and they like animals, look out the window and find all the animals that you can. Oh, the, the bird, a bird flies. And I found a squirrel. A squirrel climbs the tree. Yeah. Anything that you can relate it to their interests, they are double the chance that they will start to learn those words. And then you're adding more words to their vocabulary. I love this. My daughter has taken massive interest, I would say, in the last couple of months, all about horses. All about horses. Everything. It doesn't matter whether it shows, books, tools she's looking for the horsies everywhere she wants to talk to the horsies like be around the horsies it's horses and so all of the things that we have been doing is very directed towards that and every time we drive 
We ask her to find all the animals. We ask her to tell us the sounds of the animals. What sounds do the animals make? And, and so then she's looking at them. And I swear she has the best eyesight around because I'm looking. She's like, there's cows over there. I'm like, no, there's not. <laughs> and then we drive closer and there is. So um, it, really, it really is cool how we can engage with them and they'll engage back when we respond, you know, and in, in, with, with the things that they actually enjoy doing, you know, we're the same way. I don't like doing things that I don't enjoy. I don't, I'm, I, I like doing things that I love and I'm interested in, in specific things. And so when people talk to me about those things, my interest is, is peaked and I want to talk about it. And so I understand, you know, what you're referring to when it comes to, you know, kids and their interest and attentiveness and, um, and so my one, my one of, one of my last questions, if I could get my words out today, um, <laughs> you know, what are some common red flags, you know, for potentially for speech and language development and, you know, how can parents become more aware of this and what would be an action step for them? Okay. Um, one more thing with their interests. I'm yeah. going to say one more thing and then yeah, answer. Of course. I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> it's. I want parents to know that it's important to get down on their level. And that means mm. sitting on the floor. Yes. I sit on the floor all day because if you're standing and you look down to try to talk to your little one, they have to work very hard. They have to look up at you. They have to try to look at your face and your mouth, and then they have to listen to you all at the same time. If you sit on the floor with them, they are at eye level, which cuts all that in half. They can look you in the eye. They can look at your mouth. And all of that helps build language development. Mm -hmm. So part you using the interests is great. But even before that, get on their level. Get on their eye level. Even before you know what they're interested in. Yeah. Be, be right there with them. So some things to mention what Kara was talking about. When you have a child that's about 12 to 18 months, okay, a year, year and a half, that's the age span. And now remember, it may not happen at 12 months. Maybe your child had their first birthday but has no words. That's okay. You want to look at really the end of the age range and see where your child is. Now, at that point, you want them to be saying, mama, dada, maybe an item of a toy, something else. You're also looking for nonverbal communication. And this is something that I always talk to parents about when they say, my little one has this many words. That's important. But the nonverbal communication is just as important. So I want you to look for, are they pointing to items? Like, even if they can't have the words, are they pointing to the toy that they want? Or are they pulling you that they need help? Come help me, they're pulling you, but they don't have their, that word yet. Nonverbal communication comes first and then comes the language, the verbal, after. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that to parents is your child's, the understanding needs to come first before those words come out of their mouth. And that's what's very important. So that's something that I always recommend to parents to look at before they get concerned, okay? Are they communicating with you, but maybe don't have all the words yet? Are they pulling you? Are they pointing to something? Are they reaching their hands up when they wanna be picked up? Are they showing you in a different way that they want something? And that's very, imp that's just as important as the words that are coming out. Yeah. So, you know, what are some simple things that parents, you, you know, you mentioned getting down at eye level, you mentioned, you know, me being mindful of like their cues, but is there a, a couple other simple things potentially the parents can do, you know, to work on their behavior and language development, you know, in home? Right. Some of the best things to do, like I said, are narrate. You point as well. The parents should point to yeah. everything. You want to label everything that you're doing and repetition. You want to say everything multiple times. 
So if you're, and it should just be quick. Once you start to do it, you won't feel silly anymore. It'll, I say everything three times without even realizing it. It just all the time. Yes. And that's what you want to do. So if you're giving your little one milk, you say, milk, you're going to have a drink of milk. Here, here's some milk. You don't have to say it the exact same way, but I said milk four times in that repetition so that they can connect the words that I'm saying and what we're doing. That's what you want to work on. You want to teach them that your words have meaning. So when I say milk, it means I'm going to have a cup of milk. It has meaning. Yeah. And that's what you want to do. Re- that's why children like songs that are in repetition. It drives us crazy, but they love it. <laughs> yeah. They love it. Yes. They love it. And it's how they learn. So anytime through your day, not changing your activities, narrate what you're doing, say things in repetition and point. So you can do all the same things you were doing. But this is a great way to encourage that language and encourage that development. Awesome. This, honestly, I've learned, I've learned a few other things that I did (laughs) not know from the work that I did with my daughter. And it's, it's continuous work. You know, my son, um, he is almost 10 months and I'm already seeing much different behavior development with him and just even speech development with him already at this age versus when my daughter was at this age. So it's really incredible to watch how different children can be. And even with my stepchildren who are much older and their development and how they've, um, you know, continued on their journey through language and, and speech and all of these things. And so I know that the work is important and it starts really at that young age, but I believe that it it just continues. Like it it continues on and it just shifts and grows and evolves. And so before we really bring all this conversation full circle, is there anything else that you really feel called to share with the parents that are listening who might be really struggling right now and just, just unsure of what to do? Yeah. I know that this is hard, but I really want you to not compare to those kids at daycare or Mm -hmm. to the kids on the playground. I know that's so hard as a mama. And, but like I said, language development as in all other development happens in stages. Okay. So that ends, I want mamas to know that it happens differently. So when you have a child that's running, that means that part of the development is happening, but maybe the language is taking the back seat. And then it'll switch. They've already learned how to walk and run. They're done with that. And now they're going to start to talk more. It goes back and forth and it switches. So when you're looking at that child on the playground that's saying 20 words and yours has five, you don't know everything else about the child either. Yes. And And like I said in the beginning, don't hesitate if you think there's a concern. If anybody listening, you can message me anytime and I would answer your specific questions about your child. Because many times, like Kara said, you get, oh, just wait, just wait, just wait. Mm -hmm. But the reason early intervention is so fabulous because we get them when they are little. Yes. And we could really work together to make that progress. And if you feel that you don't want to wait, don't feel like there's something wrong with you. You are being their mother and you are protecting your child and doing whatever you can to help them. So don't hesitate if you really feel that there's a concern. And also know that look at that progress. If you got an evaluation done, then you could wait a few more months and see if you need it again. You see that where your child made progress and look for all those areas that aren't just the words. Look for how they're communicating with you. And if you hold back a little, you know, I know that's hard, mamas, but I want you to hold back as much as you can so that you can encourage that language from your little ones. And I love you brought up the comparison piece because we compare ourselves way too much on multiple different fronts and we also worry about our children and their development because there's a lot of you know 
outer opinions that also get way not weighed in but people like to share their opinions even though we sometimes don't ask for them yes. and yeah um, I, I still remember being questioned like you have her in speech therapy and my first thing was yeah of course I do why of course I do like it wasn't even a it was I didn't even second guess it of course I have my daughter in speech therapy I want her to develop in a way that you know I feel like she's benefiting from and so that she's not behind like this is this is what I want for my child and it's stating that clear boundary and like you said you know we know we know when something's off we know when something's wrong we know when we need right. to fight a little bit more for right. something we right. know we know <laughs> and so trust that so I really appreciate you know, you sharing that message with these moms and also for you taking the time in your day today to have this conversation, because this is, this is much more common than, you know, people do, do note or do realize. And so before we, before we go, I know that there's going to be moms who are going to want to connect with you. So I'd really love for you to share where they can find you on social media, how they can connect with you. And then we're going to wrap it all up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I have a Facebook group. It's a parenting Facebook group where I really focus on toddlers. I discuss language development as well as all other toddler development issues and struggles on a constant basis. And my website has the same name as my Facebook group, which is Explore Kid Talk. And the Facebook group is Explore Kid Talk parenting guidance for early childhood. I would love for anybody to join the group that is interested in these topics or has a toddler at home. I'm also very available. You can message me anytime and I get right back to you where we could set up a chat and I could help you with what's going on in your home and in your, your world. Perfect. Okay. So make sure you guys go and give her a follow, reach out to her, let her know that you connected with her through the podcast, through this conversation. And so thank you so much, Rachel, for being on the podcast, for having this incredible conversation. And thank you to everybody who has tuned in, listened in, shared. And so I will see everybody in the next episode. Thank you again, Rachel, and have a beautiful thank day, Thank you everybody. for having me. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for listening to the Sacred Mama podcast. It warms my heart to truly bring forth such beautiful conversations that were created for you to thrive and rise throughout motherhood. Because mama, this is not a journey we're meant to walk alone. Don't forget to subscribe and share a review and you can find more information and connect with me via Facebook and Instagram. You can find me on Facebook at Kara Ray and also my free community called The Sacred Mama Co. You'll also be able to find me on Instagram as Kara Ray and also The Sacred Mama. It all truly does start with you. And so thank you for tuning in and I will see you guys all in the next episode.